Thank you very much, James, <coughs> for that introduction. And my, my thanks to James Maxey and Bob Hodgson for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, thanks too to Stefano Siri um, for initially contacting me in relation to <coughs> uh, the journal translation. And also thanks to Christy Merrill for being generous enough uh, to undertake to respond. In fact, uh, when I first sent her a draft of my paper, she already responded. <laughs> so uh, she instantly shared with me some, some thoughts which I found very helpful. So I'm looking forward very much to further thoughts today. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> uh, today's the, the symposium is on the idea of cultural translation. And um, that's an idea that's been increasingly used across a wide range of discipline in the humanities, as James uh, was suggesting, um, enabling them to focus on the dynamic processes of interaction among different cultures that seems to characterize our contemporary era. In particular, uh, relatively new fields, such as post-colonial studies, migration studies, have drawn ideas from the theory and practice of translation as a means for considering the wider effects of the ways in which cultures are transmitted and developed in different contexts, either historically through the operation of <coughs> colonial expansion, slavery, migration, and the consequent global diaspora of millions of people, or more recently through the processes of globalization, immigration, and the movement of refugees that characterize, characterizes our own era. So the concept of cultural translation seems to offer a means for thinking about these processes and thinking about the ways that cultures are transported, transmitted, reinterpreted, realigned through local places, local contexts, local cultures, and of course, local languages, as well as articulating the realities of how individuals on both sides uh, experience and interpret such encounters in the contact zone between different cultures. And these have become the focus of more recent uh, post-colonial ideas about translation, which have given particular attention to the question of power, of resistance and domination in those kinds of interactions, and foregrounded the possibility of, of translation as a means of cultural and political intervention. Now, for some years now, um, I've been trying to think through the parameters of a very simple question which I don't quite yet have the answer to, uh, which is, what's the relation between the practice and theory of translation uh, to the idea of the, of the translation of cultures, or as it's often referred to, cultural translation? Today, the idea of cultural translation is used more and more widely, as this symposium attests. But what does it really involve? After all, no one translates a culture in the same way that they do a text, while Baudelaire's Fleur du Mal can be translated more or less into English. You can't, uh, you can't make a meaningful statement by saying you're going to translate French culture into American. So cultural translation must therefore refer to a specific text of some kind of, of culture that's performing an act of translation. I use text broadly there or the need for cultural translation in a particular social or political circumstance. What does it mean, though, to translate a culture? What relation would such cultural translation have to the, as it were, classical literal idea of translation, grounded, grounded as it is in the forms of language? Would other words do just as well? Are people using the term translation meaningfully? Or could you equally say change, exchange, interaction, mediation, or transformation? Could you substitute those instead without it making much difference? Why, in other words, cultural translation? Is such a thing really possible? And how far is culture something that can be translated? And if so, what's the relation, therefore, of culture to language? Can we speak of a culture in the same way that we speak of a language? And of course, what a language is, uh, <coughs> is itself a difficult question. What does it mean to transfer a word that describes the precise transformation of one language into another, English into French, say, into a more general method for cultural change and interaction? 
does the term translation have any real conceptual or theoretical weight when transferred to these realms, to culture? And is there a theoretical model that we could use comparable to those that have been developed for translation itself over many centuries? So I have a lot of questions, <laughs> a lot of questions there. But despite the, the frequent use of the phrase cultural translation, there's been surprisingly uh, little, relatively speaking, substantial theoretical analysis that focuses on, on the concept itself. It's often the case that people invoke the term um, uh, without offering a theoretical model or analysis of how it might actually work. But the complexity of the two terms, culture and translation, as James has already indicated, actually should give us pause. Culture, after all, is a very complicated and nebulous concept, one that's always changing. But we might feel that uh, we're on secure ground with translation, since it's grounded in a material activity. But theories of translation, as you know very well, have become very highly contested of late, um, particularly, in fact, to the degree uh, to which translators should take on board issues of cultural difference. So if cultural translation is metaphorically derived from literal translation, it's also the case that ideas about cultural translation are now in turn impacting theories of language and translation. All translation, it's been said, is in some sense cultural translation. It's of course only relatively recently that the phrase cultural translation has come into widespread use in the academic arena. It was first, I think, utilised by anthropologists. They get the uh, prize for the in invention of the concept. Um, <coughs> and then just about at the time they were in fact abandoning it, abandoning it, it was taken up by cultural, post-colonial uh, and translation theorists. So my project uh, is in considering the question of cultural translation is a historical as well as a theoretical one. To evaluate this more recent history that I've, I've gestured towards, but also to construct some kind of genealogy of those who've written about cultural translation. What's the history of thinking around this term? But also, what's the history of thinking uh, by people who developed ideas of what we might now anachronistically call cultural translation, but never used the term explicitly? And so this is uh, <coughs> um, the project uh, that I'm engaged on. And potential candidates for my project um, stretch through the centuries and through different cultures. Um, um, and currently from Samuel Taylor Coleridge to Franz Fanon. And today I want to discuss the work of one important figure uh, for that theoretical genealogy, and that is Sigmund Freud. What relation has Freud to translation, not only in terms of how we translate Freud, but also how he himself deploys it as a concept and as a practice? While well, there's been a lot of discussion and books written, uh, in fact, about the question of Freud and translation, the vast bulk of material and interest in relation to translation and Freud has been, of course, concerned with the translations of Freud. The discussions and critiques of the somewhat formal translations by James Strachey in the Standard Edition that were pioneered uh, quite some years ago now by Bruno Bettelheim have resulted in the recent retranslations uh, that have appeared in the new Penguin Freud edited by Adam Phillips, where Freud's German reappears in a more conversational and idiomatic mode. And some of the translators of the new edition spend a lot of time and energy detailing the various faults uh, <coughs> that they ascribe to the hapless, but I think still majestic, Strachey. The preoccupation within psychoanalytic and literary communities of the problems of translating Freud plays out, of course, against the larger question of interpreting Freud, which it must, at some level, always involve. What's interesting, first of all, in these debates, I think, is that Freud, um, that, that there's very little utilization of the question of what principle Freud himself used uh, in his own translations. He himself translated, actually, five books uh, by J.S. Mill, Charcot, Bernheim, and others, in addition to, another, uh, to a number of other texts, uh, all into German. In fact, Freud himself translated on relatively relaxed principles, producing a relatively free translation that turns the original text right into a German idiom. He's blithely oblivious to the principles of fidelity, and he makes his own translations in a spirit that's somewhat at odds with the scrupulous translations that are made of Freud himself today. 
But today I want to address a different div related question. That is, the debates about the translations of Freud also typically evolved discussion of the degree to which Freud himself was not only a practitioner but also a theorist of translation. He himself quite often discusses questions of translation, linguistic translation, which come into his accounts of hysteria, his explorations of dream work, of everyday parapraxies, jokes, and the uncanny. Translation is always emerging in Freud uh, as, as an activity. His discussions emphasize the degree to which we inhabit a translational space of some kind, suggesting that the psyche, first of all, is multilingual, alert to the constant pos possibilities of using translation as a mechanism of displacement in the face of repression. An everyday social practice of this sort, as he points out, is the use of polite euphemisms in another language when direct expression in one's own language would be embarrassing, such as, as we use in English, ménage à trois, for example, or derrière, as sometimes people use it, uh, or as Freud puts it in a paradoxical but suggestive expression in his own discussion of Dora, j'appelle un chien un chat. What Freud shows in this linguistic displacement through languages is a fundamental part, he suggests, of our psychical apparatus, not something that's only the specialised practice of experts. And such, and that, um, such that translation itself uh, could, be form, could be thought of less as a form of carrying across than as a form of displacement, dislocation, even derangement that it forms, if you like, a, a kind of practice of mental diaspora moving from one language to another. For languages, I think, are always, in a sense, migrating, beginning with the different registers in any particular language. But rather than pursuing that somewhat potentially Derridian route, I want to look uh, instead at Freud's use of translation as a metaphor or analogy for psychic activity. The practice of psychoanalysis itself, says Freud, is a form of translation. Arguably, the later theory of transference will increase the extent to which that's so. But going even further, Freud describes psychic life itself as a process of translation that operates in a dialectical relation with what he tantalizing call, tantalizingly calls not cultural translation, but cultural transformation, which is as close as he gets to ever using the word cultural translation. Kulturelle Wandlung is the phrase he uses. I want to suggest that this amounts, nevertheless, to a radical theory of cultural translation that's never been considered within the realm of translation theory. Now, Patrick Mahoney, who, along with his fellow analyst Jean Laplanche, are the, perhaps the two people who've, who've most explored the question of uh, translation in Freud in depth, and I'm indebted to their work. Mahoney argues that, in fact, that Freud should be seen as one of the great thinkers and innovators in the domain of translation, but he doesn't quite follow that up uh, within thinking about it within the realm of translation theory to, to argue why that should be the case. I think he's right, but it's easy to see why Freud hasn't been celebrated in this way. What he performs is rather, in some sense, a translation of translation theory, or perhaps more accurately, but still working within the range of meanings of the word Übersetzung, which uh, he, he, he uses frequently, uh, which of course means translate, set above, transpose, transfer, uh, he, he affects a transposition of the concept of translation. Psychoanalysis itself, he says, is a practice that affects a form of translation, but it's more complicated than that, because if it does so, it's precisely because the psyche itself has already been busy translating things into a foreign language that's unreadable to the individual subject, him or herself. So we're constantly translating things ourselves uh, into an unreadable foreign language, is what Freud is saying. So let's consider uh, some examples of his use of the concept of translation. We can find them straight away in the case histories in Freud and Breuer's Studies in Hysteria, 1895. Their theory of the hysterical symptom as a form of conversion, Freud defined as the transforma I quote, transformation of psychical excitation into chronic physical sy symptoms, which brings hysteria close to a practice of a physical bodily translation. Oddly enough, uh, we find that uh, similar ideas, I think, uh, of a, as it were, translation from the psyche to the body uh, in Coleridge and uh, Fanon, who I'm putting together in an unlikely combination. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's there in Freud too, in the theory of hysteria. Hysteria, Freud observes, is fundamentally a form of bilingualism, that's what he says, and it can take that form literally at times. So Breuer's Anna O oh at one point expresses herself by the following symptom. She switches into speaking only in English, of course she's speaking in German, uh, without realising that she's doing so. If asked to read French or Italian aloud, says Freud, I quote, she would sight-read an excellent English translation with astonishing rapidity and fluency, without realising she was translating into another language. And in some sense, psychoanalysis itself will mimic this translational facility, converting one language into another. In, this, in the case of psychoanalysis, moreover, or however, this translation won't follow the classical model of translation between distinct languages, European languages. In Freud's own case history of Katerina, which reads, in fact, as much uh, more like a short story, you could say, than a case history, Freud relates a dialogue that took place between himself and Katerina 6,000 feet up on a mountain top in the Austrian Alps. If you remember, Freud goes for a, a hike up in the, in the <coughs> Austrian Alps. He gets to the top and he's just enjoying the relaxation and the view. And uh, this uh, Austrian girl, Katerina, comes up to him and says, are you a doctor? <laughs> At which point he sighs but uh, starts talking to her. <laughs> she speaks actually in, in uh, <coughs> an Austrian country dialect that Freud actually reproduces in, uh, in uh, his account of her. Um, quite scrupulously, but of course uh, in the English version that disappears, which uh, <coughs> proves the impossibility of translating dialect, which itself is a, a very interesting aspect of uh, <coughs> issues about translation. So this is, this is in, in, in English. This is the dialogue. Freud. Fräulein Katharina, if you could remember now what was happening in you at that time, when you had your first attack, what you thought about it, it would help you. Katharina. Yes, if I could, but I was so frightened that I've forgotten everything. Freud, in parenthesis. Translated into the terminology of our preliminary communication, that's in, in the uh, book, this means the affect itself created a hypnoid state whose products were then cut off from associative connection with the ego consciousness. Now that statement represents a fundamental mode of translation in psychoanalysis uh, for Freud, the kind of translation that Jacobson would describe as intralingual. And today, after Foucault, we could also talk about it in terms of discourses, or the registers of different discourses. Freud's translation is certainly uh, between two languages, but he's not, of course, producing an equivalent in another ordinary language, but a translation of Anna's dialectical German into a new discursive regime. So he translates the girl's colloquial remarks into his own terminology, <clears throat> the scientific or medical language of psychoanalysis, through which psychoanalytic understanding is achieved. So her, I was so frightened that I've forgotten everything, becomes the affect itself created a hypnoid state whose products were then cut off from associative connection with the ego consciousness. And I'm quoting from the New Penguin uh, translation, which interestingly can't obviate, even at, the, at this point, the degree, the extreme degree to which psychoanalytic terminology moves into a scientific register, which in fact, uh, ideologically, the Penguin translation is trying to deny on the Bettelheim grounds. So even the Penguin can't, as it were, translate more than in that way. What happens in that translation or transposition from one discourse to another, apart from a move into unintelligibility for the ordinary reader, beginning, of course, with Katerina herself? Her sentence is depersonalized, and her experience moved into a universal structure of mental functioning that psychoanalysis produces as its form of theoretical understanding. I was so frightened is translated into the affect itself created a hypnoid state, while I've forgotten everything is transposed into a breaking of associative connection with ego consciousness. And at one level, this represents the fund fundamental technique of the talking cure. The cure is affected through the subject's own speech, but that speech is submitted to a kind of translation of a language which, in more complex cases, the patient herself or himself will come to understand, if not speak, as, for example, in the case of the wolfman. The particular experience of the individual is translated into the scientific discourse, impersonal scientific discourse, that enables that experience to be understood as a function of the psyche or the body as it's understood in the realm of psychoanalytic understanding. <clears throat> 
The individual's experience is depersonalized into a universal theoretical framework, one in which, of course, in Freud's case, was being continually modified. But the question that it raises, I think, is to what extent this psychoanalytic translation is more than a translation. To what extent does psychoanalysis offer real understanding or explanation as opposed to translation into its own specialized idiom, setting the one above the other? And this is actually the classic question, I think, for psychoanalytic literary criticism, one that continually plays back into psychoanalysis itself. In other words, to what extent is psychoanalysis nothing but a translation? To what extent is, as it were, is, is it only transposing what it finds into this different idiom, uh, which it then projects as a form of understanding? At one level, in this case, this does seem to be the case, except, of course, that it's a very complicated kind of translation, but it's a translation into another incomprehensible language, which we shall see is a figure that reappears uh, at a later stage. This is, obviously, this is um, one of the most common ways that Freud invokes the idea of uh, translation, and, but it's hardly an original use uh, of the practice of translation in the sense that we have the original, the girl's words, which are then translated by Freud into another language. In making that move, in fact, Freud is performing nothing less than the characteristic translation from the language of the real world into terms of abstraction that Marx would decry in Hegel and seek to reverse. And at the same time, Freud is also, as I noted, reversing that human subjective experience of Katerina so that its attributes become the attribute of something that he's created, the psyche. In the very mode of religion that Feuerbach and Marx after him with respect to philosophy would seek to retranslate or more accurately detranslate back into the realm of human agency. So one of the things that, that Freud is doing there is in some sense mimicking the process of, of religion as uh, analyzed by Feuerbach where human agency is attributed to God and Feuerbach then tries to retranslate that back into human agency. So what Katerina loses, in some sense, is human agency in Freud's translation. What's interesting is that while the language of psychoanalytic theory performs the first kind of translation, <clears throat> the second Feuerbach in Marxian strategy comprises the manner in which Freud himself deploys the concept of translation in the interpretation of dreams, where translation is put into reverse. And this, I think, is our first clue, if you like, into the nature of translation in Freud. The word Übersetzung in various formations appears at least 45 times in the interpretation of dreams. And here again, Freud uses translation uh, as a concept in different ways. Of more minor interest is his use of the term to describe the interpretation of symbolism in dreams. Some symbols, he says, are so constant in their occurrence and their meaning, they can be translated easily into specific meaning, and Freud calls these uh, stable translations. They operate rather like what the Russian linguist uh, Voloshinov calls signals. They have a fixed meaning. Such symbols have, uh, in other words, a, a, a fixed equivalent, um, as in the case of hat for chapeau, for example, or in Freud's case in his dream symbology, hat for male genitals. That's what it always means. But such symbol translation, as he calls it, is too easy and misses the point. He says, I'd like to issue an emphatic warning against overrating the importance of, dream of symbols in interpreting dreams, limiting the work of dream translation to translating symbols and abandoning the idea of making use of the dreamer's ideational associations. So the work of dream translation, the real work, is more complicated, he says. So what's involved? The first instance will be the translation of unconscious expressions into conscious rational motives or wishes. What makes this more than just a translation into another discourse at that point, however, is that psychoanalysis is now translating the unknown. <clears throat> if, if in, if in uh, the Katerina example it produced the unknown, you might say, or the unknowable, its own discourse, now it's actually translating the unknown. As Freud puts it in his discussion of Hamlet, where, uh, where he's wonderfully oblivious to the um, fact that he's discussing a fictional character, he says, quote, here I have translated into conscious terms what was bound to remain unconscious in Hamlet's mind. Again, another problem for psychoanalytic criticism. He thus very frequently summarizes an action or a dream by offering its rational meaning as his interpretation or translation. And that's relatively easy with the symptom or even the articulate literary text. 
but altogether harder with respect to the dream. At the opening of chapter 6 of the Interpretation of Dreams, the famous dream work chapter, he begins by contrasting his method with previous accounts of the meaning of dreams, in the, in, that in one way or another simply interpret what he calls the manifest dream content, or, sim or put more simply, the dream itself. The problem with dream interpretation is that people simply interpreted dreams, he says. <laughs> his innovation is to move dream interpretation into the realm of translation. The manifest dream content, the actual dream, is a translation of something else, he says, and that, including the relation between the two, is the meaning of the dream. And that's his intervention. So he sets up his model uh, of the relation of the manifest dream content to the latent or underlying dream content, or dream thoughts, as he calls them. And the dream work is the means by which the first are transformed or translated into the latter, and that's the the structure of translation. Dream thoughts, he says, and dream content lie before us like two representation of the same content in different languages, or rather a particular dream content appears to us as a version of the relevant dream thoughts, rendered into a different mode of expression, the characters and syntax of which were meant to learn by comparison of the original with the translation. So unlike the earlier instances uh, that I've, I've uh, mentioned here it's the dreams themselves rather than the analysts that are engaging in a form of translation. We translate when we dream you might say. The dream content is simply a translation into another language of the dream thoughts rendered into a different mode of expression. However dream interpretation can't involve simply returning from the target language B, i.e. the dream that, that you remember, to rediscover the original language uh, the, the, the source language, so to speak, um, the dream content, because the source language is unknown. So Freud's first claim, therefore, is that the dream thoughts and contents are simply the representation of the same content in different languages, from that quotation I just uh, read out. But it's immediately modified to a second claim, that the dream content is a version of the dream thoughts rendered into a different mode of expression, whose characters and syntax, that is, whose text, were meant to learn by comparison with the original, with the trans of the sorry of the original with the translation. That sounds very easy, but the problem is that we don't know the original. The dream thoughts are in an unknown language that we can only decipher on the basis of the translation. So it's like trying to reconstitute uh, <coughs> an original text when you only know the translation. Which, uh, when people have done that, of course, uh, interesting results have occurred uh, in literary terms. The situation that Freud describes, as he was perhaps aware, though unexpectedly he nowhere mentions it in all his writings, uh, uh, is similar to that of the Rosetta Stone, where the Egyptian, Demotic and Greek texts are placed in parallel beside each other, which of course famously, the discovery which famously enabled Champollion to decipher hieroglyphics for the first time. And Freud makes frequently compa frequent comparison of dream content to hieroglyphics. It's embedded, as it were, he says, in a hieroglyphic script whose characters need to be translated one by one into the language of dream thoughts. So why hieroglyphs in particular? Because they suggest that an unknown language requires decoding and deciphering, as was the case with Egyptian hieroglyphics until 1822. And secondly, because although primarily phonetic, hieroglyphs still retain elements of a picture language. They're made up of a combination of phonetic and ideographic signs, and that's why nobody could, uh, before Champollion, could uh, <coughs> decipher them. It's a language that, like in dreams, shifts between the linguistic and the pictorial in its representations. This is an idea, this, this is a shifting form of language, is an idea that Freud himself developed as far back as the studies in hysteria, where he compares hysteria to an unknown pictographic speech, Bildersprache, picture speech. We frequently, he says, compared the hysterical symptom symptomatology with a pictographic script, which we are unable to read once we discovered a few cases of bilingualism. With hysteria, the pictographic script is there on the surface, often on the surface of the body itself. What's required is that the analyst reconverts it back into the symptom. But in the case of dream translation, it's impossible uh, to compare the original with the translation on the Rosetta Stone model because the original isn't there to be read. It can only be inferred. All we have is the translation from an unknown language. 
So psychoanalysis finds the meaning of dreams uh, not in the dreams themselves, but in these invisible origins. In dreams, we have only the translation, and the patient and analyst's job is to translate the incomprehensible dream content back into its original, to th and then to analyze and repeat in reverse the work of translation that's transformed uh, the first into the second. So dream interpretation, as Jean Laplanche has suggested, is more a question of detranslation, of untranslating, trying to detranslate the dream back to its lost original. And this is where and why the work of interpretation through association must come into play, break, breaking down the dream content into its parts one by one, working through the dreamer's association. The analyst and dreamer then engage in the laborious work of detranslating the dream content back to its original dream thoughts, and this produces the meaning of the dream. So it becomes a kind of reverse translation, translating the dream back into its unconscious original, repeating in reverse the dream work. It's carried out the original translation. However, in fact, it's still more difficult than that. It's, that, it's, not, as, well, it's not as simple as that. Because actually the dream in its translation isn't a proper translation in the normal way that might be, would be normally thought of in terms of the translation of one language to another. For it is, in a sense, a willfully bad translation in which the ego tries to disguise the meaning of the dream thoughts altogether subjecting them, therefore, to distortion, condensation, and displacement, and all the other mechanisms of repression. In other words, it's a kind of nightmare translation, the kind of translation that translators meet with or invent in bad dreams. It's like a kind of manically, willfully bad translation, uh, or perhaps um, uh, a transcreation, uh, as, as were. it's a form of poetry, it might say. It's been transformed, so that it's been doubly disguised. It's willfully obscured. So that the detranslator not only has to detranslate the dream, but also has to do that according to a procedure which reverses the mechanisms of repression. And it's that bizarre process of translation that the patient has to turn around in order to achieve psychic health. But how easy will that be, given that she has to rediscover an original that she never knew from a translation that's willfully obscured its relation to the original? Almost impossible, you might say. But Freud is unabashed, and he remains confident. Once he's isolated the four major mechanisms of the dream work, then the dream does, quote, nothing but translate the relevant dream thoughts in accordance with the four conditions prescribed. Without a knowledge of those conditions, then the work of detranslation will be impossible. Unlike conventional translation, it may be observed, in dean translation, there's then no har hierarchy, really, between the different texts because although the original dream thoughts may be the primary text, the source text, they're only made evident through the process of detranslation, in which they're restated by the analyst into the transposed language of psychoanalysis. So in fact, we never actually get to the original as such. We only get to a third text, which is the analyst's recreation uh, of the original and of its meaning. So if psychoanalysis operates as a model of translation and detranslation, it's a translation like none other. And <coughs> so his model of translation is really as Id idiosyncratic as psychoanalysis itself. How useful, though, you might say, is this bizarre model of translation for other kinds of translation? Perhaps it's no wonder that Freud's <coughs> me method hasn't been taken up in general by translators. There are, after all, few instances uh, where we have uh, the translation but not the original, and an original that's been willfully distorted. This is no doubt uh, <coughs> why Freud, as were, is not seen as a translation theorist, but as a theoretical paradigm, I think it remains infinitely suggestive. It offers, for example, a possible way of reading things that are invisible. For example, uh, as we say in postcolonial studies, subaltern speech, speech by people who don't weren't able or are not able to represent themselves directly, but whose form of public representation distorts their fundamental being, where the invisibility or oppression of subaltern people in official discourses and documents from the past requires something of a detranslation exercise to make them visible in their own terms. All of us are being translated, as it were, in the, in the, in the, the kind of idiom that Freud himself engages with, with Katerina, as we move into various forms of public discourse, medical discourse, and the like. Or it could be used in the context of ideology, which, according to classic Marxist theory, deliberately distorts the conditions of the real. That's a bit, again, like a, a, a dream translation 
And we might also find an analogy in the situation with a situation with respect to, the, to having an unknown mother tongue that Derrida describes in his monolingualism of the other, trying to reconstitute a mother tongue that you never knew. Interestingly, Freud himself points out elsewhere, his position in general here comes quite close, I think, to that of Kant. He shows he's a good, science, a good scientist and a, a Kantian, in effect. And the difference being that whereas Kant says not knowing the thing in itself doesn't matter, for Freud, getting to the originating dream thoughts is precisely what does matter. Uh, but their techniques for getting to know the thing in itself are, in fact, in quite similar because they both then produce the conditions through which that information is processed. Meanwhile, the paradox of Freud's own use tr of translation could be said to be that psychoanalysis as a discursive practice <coughs> translates experience into the register of abstraction, on the one hand, but at the same time it seeks to detranslate the displaced or abstracted thoughts of its patients back into the reality of their repressed originals. So Freud, we could say, has, has developed a theory of a, a double or doubled translation. It's two kinds of translations operating at the same time, and it's this dialectical form that at once moves forwards and backwards uh, that I, I want to suggest that constitutes the heart of his theory, as I would call it, of cultural translation, and in some sense seems to me to be um, typical of uh, theories of cultural translation in, in general. In that context, in, in the last part of uh, my talk today, I want to look at a way that Freud himself describes the process of psychic life as a form of translation and how he develops that into an idea of sublimation, which amounts to a theory or a kind of cultural translation. And in many ways, I think Freud anticipates the idea of, of cultural translation uh, at this point with rather different implications from our current use of the term. Though, again, he doesn't use the term as such, his focus on issues of translation and culture had the effect of putting two, the two together in a kind of double dialectical way that operates on the same model as that that I've just described. He summarised his general thesis in this area in a 1932 letter to Albert Einstein, uh, which is known as Why War? And he put it in this way. Since time immemorial, mankind has been moving through the process of cultural evolution. Brackets. I know that, that, that there are those who prefer the term civilization. It's to this process that we owe the best that we have become, and a great deal of that which causes us suffering. The ambivalent cultural evolution that mankind has been moving through is recapitulated in the individual life of the human being, where, quote, the cultural suppression of the instincts affects the translation of the, uh, of the individual from the state of the child to that of the adult. You grow up by repressing your instincts and you acquire culture. In Freud, cultural translation is the result of the denial, suppression, renunciation or repression of the instincts. It works in two ways at once, as he says to Einstein. On the one hand, for good, for civilization, for culture, for society, but for the individual, it's not so hot you repress your instincts, you become unhappy. This dialectic is articulated, as I'm sure you know, explicitly in Civilization and its Discontents in 1931, where Freud argues that culture represses sexuality while repressed sexuality is sublimated into cultural production. Civilization and all its achievements, such as art, technology, arise from what's both lost and gained in translation. The word Freud here uses to describe the movement through successive stages of the repression of sexual drives in the individual psyche from infant to adult is not translation, uh, although he does do this. Uh, he does use that term in, a, in an earlier letter where, uh, to Fleece, where he uh, sketches out a, a kind of first version of this book, which I haven't got time to uh, go into today. But it, uh, he does use the term translation there. But in, in cult civilization and its discontents. He uses the term sublimation, not übersetzung, but sublimierung. The meaning of those two words is strikingly close. While übersetzung means to place or set above, sublimierung means to an elevation to a higher state or plane of existence, something more sublime, transmutation uh, to the above. Translation, if you like, say, in the, sen in the English sense now reserved for saints, such as Elijah, who are translated straight to heaven. Or in German, of course, the sub of sublimierung also has the, has the other 
as it were, direction built in, the, the, as it were, going below, the beneath, the, the sub of the subterranean. You go up or you go down. The two words remain provocatively close, and of course, uh, in a longer discussion, you could, of course, link them to also to Alf Hemel, uh, which circulates in the same trajectory, you might say. Like translation, the, tr the transmutation of sublimation pushes the instincts onto a higher plane, but by repressing them in the process, sending them lower. It produces unpleasure and leaves a malaise or discontent in its wake. So, so immediately we have something that, again, is going in two directions uh, at the same time. So much for this translational process, but what about culture? True to his preference for idiomatic translations, Freud was very happy with what's become the iconic title of the tra English translation of the book, Civilization and Its Discontents. But it's significant that his original title was something a little different, which was Das Unbehagen in der Kultur, which translates literally as the uneasiness, discomfort, or malaise, or unpleasure, in more Freudian terms perhaps, uh, in culture. So the first interesting, or first question really, is why uh, the, the, the German terms Kultur in the original title wasn't uh, translated as culture but as civilization. It would, civilization would probably have been the more obvious word to use in English at that time. Um, uh, think of Henry Buckle's History of Civilization in England uh, of the 19th century, which actually in some respect uh, can be linked to Freud's. But today, civilization doesn't have such positive connotations, I think. It's not a word that we use so unselfconsciously in English, given the legacy in particular of col the colonial civilizing mission, which of course is a French uh, concept but picked up by all colonizers, uh, according to which uh, civilization, which was supposed to distinguish Europeans from non-Europeans uh, in the colonial racial hierarchy, was exactly what justified the colonial practice. So today we might actually feel more comfortable with the word culture rather than civilization, especially since in English its broader anthropological meaning, uh, a sense of as it were, culture as, as the material of, every, of everyday life, has supervened upon its er earlier elite meaning of the arts, i.e. high culture. As an OED entry from the Financial Times of 2001 put it, quote, in 15 years culture has moved from the most sublime performances of opera, dance and classical music to street parties, social inclusion, and fun. <laughs> now, as that, as that quote might indicate, a literal translation of Freud's The Uneasiness of, of Culture, in Culture, would in some sense also be somewhat perplexing today, because why should we be uneasy about culture today, since it's uh, fun? <laughs> in the 1920s and 30s, by contrast, there were many tracts, books, poems written about the widespread sense of Western culture having become unbearable and unlivable. Think of T.S. Eliot, D.H. Lawrence, uh, the, the, as well, the whole trajectory of, of the 1930s was in some sense directed against uh, contemporary culture. Lawrence uh, would agree, I think, with Freud's uh, description of the common view in 1931 that, quote, much of the blame for our misery lies with what we call our culture. I'm using, I'm translating culture Kultur as culture there, and that we should be far happier if we were to abandon it and revert to primitive conditions. Hence, of course, in the 20th century, the whole drive, the search for primitivism in, in 20th century art, for example. But the particular historical discontent with civilization or hostility to culture in the 20s and 30s, which was largely the result of the extravagant imperialist nationalism which produced the First World War, is not the only reason, although there's a, it's related, why discontent with culture seems somewhat anachronistic. In Freud's day, the culture, the term culture in English or German had itself an aura that's largely lost today. In the 20s and 30s, the common view was that there were two rival European cultures or civilizations, often characterized as Anglo-French civilization versus German Kultur. This distinction was, of course, itself the product of the ideology of the First World War, or bound up in the First World War, and continued up into the Nazi era and even beyond. The word Kultur even became an English word, can be found in the OED, where its meaning is given as, I quote, civilization as conceived by the Germans, especially used in a derogatory sense during the 1914, 18, 1939, 45 wars, as involving notions of racial and cultural arrogance, militarism, and imperialism. <laughs> 
<coughs> Kultur, the Times opined in 1915, in fact has become the exact opposite of culture. So Kultur, the German Kultur, to the British represented a brute Prussian militarism that lacked all ethics. So Kipling, for example, wrote in 1918, it's the peculiar essence of German Kultur, which is the German religion, that it's Germany's moral duty to break every tie, every restriction that bind man to fellow men if she thinks it will pay. And basically every time that every, every as it were, every um, uh, time that something horrific uh, emerged from the First World War in terms of German uh, practices, the destruction of the Belgian city of Louvain, for example, uh, uh, people would invoke this ideology of, of German culture. So that John Buchan, uh, in his history of the Great War, already was characterizing it as responsible for what he, even in those, at that time, which is 1921, uh, he described as, the, as a holocaust. So for this reason, in, in 1931, when Freud's book was being translated, the resonances of the word that he was using, Kultur, in English, however foreign from his own uh, usage, meant that the better equivalent was the more francophone or anglicized civilization. Of course, I should say, I mean, as, as I'm sure you know, that in Germany, all this sort of thinking was exactly reversed. <laughs> So that uh, Kultur was associated with, uh, in Germany, with the exact opposite of that uh, in England. So they thought in terms of elevated German culture, which was regarded as the opposite of crass Anglo-American commercialism. So and that's what they were defending. They were defending culture. Uh, uh, so, so these were ideologically split. Although the term Zivilisation does exist in German, Freud never uses it in his text. Um, in f he always uses the word culture. And as we've already heard in the Einstein letter, he prefers it. But given our contemporary reservations about civilization with respect, uh, <coughs> um, and an amnesia with, with respect to the Germ German, alleged German concept of Kultur, the transmutation of the meaning of the word culture in English into a broader uh, meaning, what if we were to think and rethink Freud's text today in terms of it being not about civilization but about culture? What if we followed the, in this case, interestingly unadopted principles of the new penguin Freud and retranslated Freud's title more accurately as something like unpleasure in culture and substituted the word culture for civilization uh, throughout the text? which is what I'm now going to proceed to do in my final remarks. Freud's description of culture comes, uh, first comes in part two devoted to questions of human happiness. The word, he says, quote, designates the sum total of those achievements and institutions that distinguish our life from those of our animal ancestors and serve the dual purpose of protecting human beings against nature and regulating their mutual relations. The process of culture, he suggests, produces all that's finest in human existence, but the sublimation of the drives which it demands is achieved at some personal cost, as we've seen. He then proposes a parallel between the process of culture and the libidinal development of the individual, both of which involve the sublimation of the drives, collectively or individually. So culture is a process of translation for the individual where each one of us learns to control or displace their erotic and aggressive drives. Quote, sublimation of the drives, says Freud, is a particularly striking feature of cultural development which makes it possible for the higher mental activities, scientific, artistic, ideological, to play such a significant role in cultural life. Sublimation, if you like, is the fate that society imposes on the drives, while it's also, of course, sublimation that produces culture for society, indeed produces culture at society itself. But this leads to the darker insight of the book that culture is built on renunciation and non-satisfaction of the sexual drives through repression. So one effect of culture's restriction of sexual life is to prove, produce what Freud calls cultural frustration. Cultural frustration is how Kultur Versagung is generally translated, but Versager in German means more like failure or refusal. So the unpleasant sublimation or translation that culture requires paradoxically produces cultural denial or refusal of culture. And it's the uneasiness of culture that Freud describes in 1931 that's therefore the result, the very result of its successful cultural translations. What does this theory mean for translation? For Freud, at one level, <clears throat> culture involves a process of sublimation that produces psychic translation. <clears throat> 
For the individual and society, it's nothing less than a process of repression that produces translation through its mechanisms of sublimation. Translation, for its part, is thus nothing less than a procedure of sublimation in which the original sexual drives are renounced. But what's distinctive about that process of cultural translation, and what's, if you like, different from regular translation, is that in Freud these translated elements, these repressed elements of sexuality, actually never disappear in the translated person because they've just been repressed. So they, they continue to haunt the individual and reappear, of course, retranslated in dreams. And for those whose translations haven't been entirely successful, they haven't repressed successfully, in the symptoms of hysteria, neurosis, um, being ill. So it's not a question of conventional translation when we're moving to, from text A to B and leave text A behind so that you forget, ideally, that it was ever written in another language, but rather that we move towards text B by making text A unconscious, repressed, but that text A still haunts text B as its shadow and is liable to reappear in disguised form at any moment. It never goes away. Cultural translation in Freud, therefore, is not a process by which former elements are, endeavor, are ever left behind, but one in which the new text is always doubled and haunted, its translations always remaking themselves, the translated text perpetually seeking to revert back to its original, rather like a ball held under water. The different languages, as in the dream, remain forever present. So in another sense, according to Freud, we live in two or more languages at once. And this bio-multilingualism, in which, as it were, like Anna O, oh, we read one language but translate it simultaneously into another, can illuminate how in this model the general sense of loss in translation modifies its gain, while in cultural terms much is gained, for the individual this gain produces, of course, a constant sense of unease, malaise, cultural frustration, denial, or dislocation, we might say. Nostalgia for a past that's been suppressed, and even, as Freud suggests, guilt. And in this situation, while initially Freud draws on the older uh, terms of sexuality, sublimation and repression, increasingly he mo moves towards a dialectical account of the translation relation being one of perpetual struggle or ambivalence, a struggle between these, uh, between these two texts, as it were, translation as struggle. The malaise of contemporary culture or civilization in Freud's day comes from too successful a history of sublimation, or we might say of cultural translation. The more successful it is, then paradoxically, the more ambivalent individuals feed about, feel about it and the more inclined they are to reject it. At this point, Freud comes much closer to Marx with his theory of alienation than to Hegel, for whom culture, of course, is the objective expression of the subjective spirit. But in contrast to Hegel, in Freud, the development of culture produces an increasing tension between the community and the individual. For Freud, cultural translation and sublimation is something about, best, which, about which we can at best feel only ambivalent. The patient, he says, may be psychically, sorry, Patrick Mahoney says, the patient may be psychically conceived as an accumulation of translations. For its part, tr culture is not just a process of translations, but a process of translation itself, one whose effect will always be doubled because it works simultaneously in two directions, just like the discourse of psychoanalysis, in fact, which mimics the repressive hierarchical transpositions of culture by translating the primitive speech of the subject into the elevated language of scientific knowledge, while at the same time attempting to detranslate the subject speak, speech back into its lost original. And cultural translation? If culture invo involves a process of translation, how it might be asked, can cultures themselves be translated, except, therefore, as a translation of translations, because they're already translations? Unless we articulate and highlight its dialectical struggle of a two-way doubling, then if culture is always a form of translation, then the phrase cultural translation would, in a sense, always be a tautology. And perhaps this explains why, for all his many uses of the word culture and translation, and his anal analyses of the complex dialectical play between them, Freud himself never actually uses the phrase cultural translation. Thank you. <laughs>